Our next paper is B.B. Warfield on Evolution and Theology. It comes from Professor Bradley Gunlock, who is Professor of History here at Trinity. He specializes in American intellectual, cultural, and religious history, as well as enjoy te he enjoys teaching uh, history more broadly, particularly with respect to Reformation era history and theology. He's well known for his book, Process and Providence, the Evolution Question at Princeton, and is currently at work on a biography of Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield. I can honestly say I can think of no one better to uh, address the topic of B.B. Warfield's views of science and, and science and theology than Brad Gunlock. So help me welcome Brad Gunlock. Thank you, Tom, and I want to thank the Henry Center for the wonderful honor of joining this fine company of scholars today. So my paper is B.B. Warfield on evolution and theology, uh, about which there's a great deal to say. I'm making no attempt at being encyclopedic. Rather, I will focus in on a few things. I know that people tend to have sometimes even sort of hobbyist questions about Warfield on certain very particular topics, and I'm very happy to field those afterwards. Uh, whether or not you want to respond to anything in the paper. But here we go. What did Benjamin Breckinridge Warfield actually hold concerning evolution and human origins? Lately, there's been disagreement on this question, or rather these questions, plural. While Warfield has long been identified as a, quote, theistic evolutionist, unquote, and therefore offering sound precedent for evangelicals to take that position, Fred Zaspel has countered with the claim that Warfield never accepted evolution and, in fact, uttered many damning criticisms of it. At the most recent ETS meeting in Providence just in November, Zaspel's work was featured in the rollout of a new multidisciplinary polemical volume against theistic evolution, and that session attracted a huge audience. Interpretations of Warfield's views on evolution and human origins fall into three categories with some spectrum of opinion within them. The Warfield as evolutionist camp includes J.I. Packer, Mark Knoll, and David Livingstone, and Peter Enns. Packer wrote in 1978, I recall that B.B. Warfield was a theistic evolutionist. If on this count I am not an evangelical, then neither was he. And this is exactly that use of Warfield as exhibit A. Noel and Livingstone, in their fine collection of Warfield's writings on the subject, which, by the way, I recommend very much. It's called Evolution, Science, and Scripture, and they've gathered together almost everything Warfield wrote specifically on the scientific question of evolution. They call it one of the best-kept secrets in American intellectual history that B.B. Warfield, the ablest modern defender of the theologically conservative doctrine of the inerrancy of the Bible, was also an evolutionist. And that, again, is a quote. This strong statement, admittedly designed to jolt discussion into more fruitful channels, they nuance soon thereafter, describing Warfield as, quote, a cautious, discriminating, but entirely candid proponent of the possibility that evolution might offer the best way to understand the natural history of the earth and of humankind." Unquote. Their inclusion of humankind here can be misleading, as I will argue below. But their emphasis on Warfield's caution and discrimination is exactly right. Pete Enns provides us with a good example of a less careful appeal to Warfield, declaring on the Biologos website that Warfield, quote, as is well known, accepted evolution as giving the proper scientific account of human origins, unquote. Now, agreeing with this identification of Warfield as an evolutionist is the late Henry Morris, leader of the modern creationist movement. For him, Warfield's example serves evangelicals not as sound precedent, but as a warning, Warfield was guilty of, quote, pervasive theological apostasy, unquote. He betrayed the doctrine of biblical authority by caving into evolutionism, and following him would put us on the slippery slope 
fundamentalist suspicion toward Warfield on evolution marks then the second category of interpretations. Zaspel now offers, uh, excuse me, opens a third view of Warfield. As an evangelical and inerrantist, who indeed modeled openness to scientific theories of evolution, but whose example in not accepting them we should follow. Zaspel portrays Warfield as moving away from his earlier allowances for evolution by the end of his career, and never having accepted it outright once he started thinking theologically about the issue. Zaspel builds his case on multiple citations from Warfield's writings, and especially on Warfield's statement in 1916 that though he came to college already a Darwinian of the purest water, that's Warfield's phrase, he fell away from it around the age of 30. So what did Warfield actually hold concerning the evolution of species and especially concerning the origin of humankind? I will front load my conclusions here and then substantiate them somewhat <laughs> by appeal to the more important of his publications on the subject as well as to other evidence not usually brought into the question. Finally, I will turn our attention to ways in which developmental thinking, developmental thinking pervaded Warfield's theology outside of the question of biological origins. So, Warfield clarified and developed his position on evolution throughout his career, but its overall shape is clear and consistent. His position includes the following points, which I'll simply enumerate as 10 points. One, the Earth may very well be very old. And the question, even of the antiquity of man, is of no real consequence to the theologian. Two, the genealogies in Genesis were not intended to yield a chronology. Three, rather, their purpose is to impress us with, quote, the greatness of those grand men of old, towering as they did in strength and endurance above all that the world has since seen, unquote. Thus, Warfield took as fact the extreme longevity of the antediluvians. Four, species may have come from other species by means of descent under the providential government of God. In other words, transmutation, maybe, maybe that happens. Five, but God created the original world stuff ex nihilo and intruded supernatural power to create life and to make man and perhaps at many other steps too. Six, God's providential superintendence of the world is not limited to the use of natural laws. Seven, theistic evolution is unbiblical and insufficient for the Christian. Eight, Adam may have had a brute ancestry, but he was not himself just the product of evolution. Nine, the biblical doctrines of God, man, and sin contradict the theory of human evolution. Ten, creation and evolution are mutually exclusive concepts, for evolution is providence. The first thing to observe about this list is how it defies categorization. It may seem even to lack coherence. Warfield allows brute ancestry from humankind, but denies human evolution. He takes the ages of the antediluvians literally, but says they are not intended for constructing a chronology. He allows and even holds as likely the transmutation of species, yet says it's wrong to speak of God creating by evolution. No wonder there's disagreement as to Warfield's embrace of evolutionism. So I'd like to give a brief sketch of Warfield's historical moment now. To understand Warfield's views on evolution and theology, we must consider his situation in time and place. He came of age at just the time when Darwin's work was gaining acceptance in scientific circles, but encountering opposition in the church. He grew up in a family of Kentucky Presbyterians distinguished in religion and politics, the Breckenridges on his mother's side. His father and grandfather, Warfield, were pioneering breeders of shorthorn cattle, 
so that young Ben Wardfield came to the evolution question from actual experience of the effects of selection in breeding. As he later recalled, when he, went to Princeton, when he went to college at Princeton at the age of 16 in 1868, quote, I was already a, Dar already a Darwinian of the purest water and knew my origin of species and animals and plants under domestication almost from A to Izzard, unquote. That autumn, James McCosh arrived at Princeton as its dynamic new president, the first American religious leader to come out publicly for the doctrine of evolution. McCosh's Christianity and Positivism, 1871, embraced the transmutation theory while at the same time forcefully countering the metaphysical and epistemological dangers that tended to accompany the theory, especially positivism. Warfield called McCosh distinctly the most inspiring force he encountered in his college days. Not because Mikash convinced him of evolution, but presumably because Mikash modeled a serious engagement of Christian conviction with natural science, confidently showing that one could follow modern learning and still believe the Bible's this-worldly claims, accessible to historical and scientific scrutiny, not just its spiritual or moral teachings. In this way, Warfield was launched on a trajectory fundamentally different from the followers of Schleiermacher. Mikasha's writings averted a disastrous war between science and faith, said George McCloskey, professor of natural history at Princeton. And in his college, men have studied biology without discarding their religion. And Princeton was very proud of this, Mikasha's legacy. Warfield was a student at Princeton Seminary under Mikasha. Uh, while Makash was still there, and Warfield was a student at Princeton Seminary when Charles Hodge wrote, What is Darwinism? And Hodge concluded in that book, in the most quoted anti-Darwinian line ever, it is atheism. Warfield would follow Hodge in the view that Darwinism itself, evolution by natural selection with the express denial of divine design, was indeed atheistic, though other evolutionisms were not, which, by the way, was the view of Hodge as well. By the time Warfield came back to Princeton Seminary as a professor of systematic theology in 1887, evolutionism had taken the field in science, and many religious leaders had joined Mikash in seeing it as, quote, God's method of creation. But change over time by natural causes was becoming a fascination far beyond the life sciences. And the triumphs of Darwinism as a catch-all for any and all transmutation theories now lent scientific prestige to older theories about the origins of scripture and to newer theories about the progress of Christianity in the rejection or recasting of old orthodoxies. People would speak of the evolution of religion and the evolution of Christianity positively. Eventually, the fundamentalist controversies of the 1920s would bind evolutionism to theological liberalism in the minds of the faithful. But in Warfield's time, during the mature years of his career, many orthodox theologians accepted biological evolutionism to some degree. But Warfield himself took a trajectory somewhat apart. He followed scientific developments with an interested eye and cheerfully welcomed new discoveries in archaeology, astronomy, and paleontology, but he retained a wariness about the metaphysical and philosophical assumptions that often attended scientific claims. When evolutionary theory went through a decades-long crisis around 1900, a period Peter Bowler calls the eclipse of Darwinism, Warfield gave particular attention to the question of biological evolution. For at that stage, the science was focusing not on the factuality of transmutation, but the how, offering many rival theories, none of which seemed to stick. Most were methodologically naturalistic. Some, like Henri Bergson's, were not. Mikash, Charles Hodge, and many other conservative evangelicals had identified Darwin's denial of supernatural agency as the crux of the evolution question theologically, 
Now, when natural selection seemed an insufficient explanation for the, non, the neo-Darwinian synthesis of natural selection with Mendelian genetics would come only after 1930, and yet liberal theologians were offering a Christianity shorn of the miraculous, claiming to be marching with science. Warfield identified supernaturalism as the key issue of his day. A staunch confessional Calvinist, Warfield turned to Calvin and to the Reformed scholastics for resources to explore the modes of God's supernatural activity in the world. And now a section framing the evolution question for theological students. In his recollections of President Mikash, Warfield said it was about at the age of 30 that he himself fell away from Mikash's orthodoxy, meaning a firm belief in the origin of species by natural selection, that is, Darwinian evolution, with the proviso that God had instituted the system of natural selection. This is the orthodoxy from which Warfield says he fell away about the age of 30. A zealous opponent of attempts to revise the Westminster Confession, Warfield here poked fun at the hidebound orthodoxy of scientific opinion when it came to evolution. It is important to note that Warfield was not denying transmutation. Rather, he denied the sufficiency of natural selection, even if God ordained to achieve transmutation. By the time Warfield took the chair of theology at Princeton at the age of 36, he had concluded that any form, this is a quote, any form of evolution which rests ultimately on the Darwinian idea is very improbable as an account of how God has wrought in producing species, unquote. The scientific arguments Warfield find, found far from convincing. He hastened to add, though, that he was not denying that species came by descent. Rather, if they did, it was not merely by the powers that God had built into nature. That would be mere deism. And Christianity demanded something more. Quote, a thoroughgoing evolutionism cannot be held in entire consistency with some other Christian doctrines, especially the doctrine of the substantiality and immateriality of the soul and its life after the death in the body. The soul must have an origin above nature. Warfield declared himself a pure agnostic, that's again a quote, a pure agnostic, on the question, quote, whether species have in any way come by descent. And he even stated that the, quote, soul passage in Genesis 1 and 2, which appears to bar the way to an evolutionary account of man, quote, is the very detailed account of the creation of Eve. And yet he concluded, though now a long quotation, the upshot of the whole matter is that there is no necessary antagonism of Christianity to evolution, provided that we do not hold to too extreme a form of evolution. To adopt any form that does not permit God freely to work apart from law, and that does not allow miraculous intervention in the giving of the soul, in creating Eve, etc., will entail a great reconstruction of Christian doctrine and a very great lowering of the detailed authority of the Bible. But if we condition the theory by allowing the constant oversight of God in the whole process and his occasional supernatural interference for the production of new beginnings by an actual output of creative force producing something new, that is, something not included even in posse in preceding conditions, we may hold to the modified theory of evolution and be Christians in the ordinary orthodox sense. I say we may do this. Whether we ought to accept evolution, even in this modified sense, is another matter. And I leave it purposely an open question." Unquote. Here then, in 1888, though Warfield considered the transmutation theory far from proven, he allowed the possibility that Adam was the progeny of brute ancestors. Provided that God intruded direct supernatural power in giving him a soul. It is striking that these statements come from Warfield's lectures to students in the required theology sequence. He treated the evolution question in his lecture on theological anthropology, the doctrine of humankind. 
He also, however, warned against a thoroughgoing evolutionism that would limit God's activity in the world to indirect influence always and only through natural laws. And he countered the growing scientific claim that evolution had, accept, had uh, attained the status of proven fact. Now a section turning to current science and the reformed theological heritage. Over the next decade, it became increasingly clear to Warfield that more theological work needed to be done here. On the one hand, he sought input on the current question of soul origins from various disciplines, including biologists and philosophers. On the other hand, he found particularly useful the work of reformed theologians of centuries past, Johannes Wolevius and John Calvin. Perhaps the most surprising episode in Warfield's exploration of questions related to evolution came in 1890 when he was launching a new theological journal, the Presbyterian and Reformed Review, after his falling out with Charles Briggs. Just as he was embarking on several years of intense controversy in the Presbyterian Church over the higher criticism of the Bible, the revision of the Westminster Confession, and the heresy trials of Briggs and A.C. McGifford, Warfield organized a symposium of several articles for the PRR around the theme, What is Animal Life? To explore the possibility that the human soul had arisen from or at least had something in common with an immaterial component in animals. Contributors included paleontologists William, Ber William Berryman Scott, who was Charles Hodge's grandson and a non-Darwinian evolutionist professor at Princeton College, and paleontologist John William Dawson, the last great North American scientist to hold out against evolution, theologians William G.T. Shedd, and John DeWitt, philosopher John Dewey, yes, John Dewey, early in his career, and theistic evolutionist Henry Calderwood. Intent on guarding the duality of mind and body in human beings, Warfield invited input from science and philosophy on the possibility that the soul had evolved, not indeed from body, but from an immaterial principle in animal precursors. And Warfield published multiple views in his conservative new journal dedicated to Calvinist orthodoxy. Now to jump forward for a moment, Warfield ultimately rejected this idea of a separate soul evolution. The coup de grace to this idea seems to have come from James Orr's Stone Lectures at Princeton, delivered in 1903 and published as God's Image in Man and its Defacement in the Light of Modern Denials. Warfield and his colleagues cited this work of Orr's repeatedly. Orr argued that the production of man could not be divided into two, into two separate works, the production of the body and the production of the soul, for the step from brute to man required physical changes adequate to support the new spiritual endowments. And the Bible, in any case, treated humankind as a unity of soul and body, the separation of which, by the fall, was utterly unnatural. Now back into the history, we were at 1890, now we're moving forward a bit to 1896. By 1896, the forward momentum of what would come to be called the theo uh, theological liberalism was undeniable. And it was clear to Warfield that, quote, the magic watchword of evolution, unquote, was aiding and abetting the rapid recasting of Christianity in non-miraculous terms. Warfield devoted an address at the opening of the seminary year, 1896, to the importance of Christian supernaturalism. That was the title of his address. Christian supernaturalism as the crying need of the hour in response to movements in both science and theology. And here a quote. How absolutely determinant the concept of evolution has become in the thinking of our age, there can be no need to remind ourselves. It may not be amiss, however, to recall the anti-supernaturalistic root and the anti-supernaturalistic effects of the dominance of this mode of conceiving things, and thus to identify in it the cause of the present persistent anti-supernaturalism, which at present characterizes the world's thought." Unquote. 
So rather than ask what kind and measure of supernaturalism does the Christianity of Christ require, Warfield lamented, too many people ask how little of the supernatural may be admitted and yet men continue to call themselves Christians. They look, quote, to de-supernaturalize Christianity so as to bring it into accord with the prevailing worldview. Hence, the higher critical view of the Bible as a record of the naturalistic development of the religion of Israel. Hence, also, the denial of the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection of Christ, and his miracles. Observe that Warfield pointed here to four of the future five fundamentals. But unlike many fundamentalists of the 1910s and 20s, Warfield did not blame liberalism on the transmutation theory itself. Rather, it was an anti-supernaturalistic worldview that was the trouble. Indeed, even in this address, Warfield went on pointedly to reaffirm, quote, the reality and efficiency of second causes, unquote. God created, quote, real substance endowed with real powers that really act and really produce their effects. Just because he believes that the universe was well made, the Christian believes that the forces with which it was endowed are competent for its ordinary government, and he traces in their action the divine purpose unrolling its faultless scroll, unquote. Note here that unrolling is the precise English equivalent of the Latin evolving. Warfield goes on to say that the Christian is free to trace out God's use of second causes in all the products of time, and even to welcome the words of Tennyson in his rather desolating poem, In Memoriam. This solid earth whereon we tread in tracts of fluent heat began and grew to seeming random forms the seeming prey of cyclic storms, till at last arose the man. To the extent that nature unrolled, Warfield is saying, it was under the providential government of God. But, quote, in our conception of a supernatural God, we must not erect his providential activity into an exclusive law of action for him and refuse to allow of any other mode of operation. And here, Warfield suggested a striking possibility. Quote, who can say, for example, whether creation itself in the purity and absoluteness of that conception may not be progressive and may not correlate itself with and follow the process of the providential development of the world in the plan of such a God so that the works of creation and providence may interlace through all time in the production of the completed universe. It appears that Warfield here was considering a doctrine of progressive creation by evolution, with species coming by transmutation sometimes through the unfolding, excuse me, with species coming by transmutation, sometimes through the unfolding of built-in potentialities, sometimes along with the intrusion of supernatural creative power. So sometimes it's happening so to speak, naturally, sometimes there's a shot of God power into there, too, from outside. Just at this time, the American school of neo-Lamarckian evolution, among whose leaders were some of the science professors at Princeton University, was adopting a theory of orthogenesis, which highlighted the presence of overarching linear trends in the history of life forms. Cope's law, for example, noted the tendency in parallel evolutionary lines toward larger body size, even when it finally became disadvantageous. This suggested a pattern pre-programmed into the separately evolving lines, since the changes arose in parallel and without adaptive benefit. So we find here Warfield following current scientific theories and tentatively considering them in view of his theological commitments. But within five years, Warfield came to view creation by evolution as an impossibility. For in doing further reading, he was persuaded that creation and evolution were rightly understood as mutually exclusive terms. The theologian who so persuaded him 
was the early 17th century Calvinist Johannes Wallib of, ba of Basel, Basel, excuse me, 1586 to 1629, better known by the Latinized name Wolebius. In his Compendium Theologiae Christiani, 1626, Wolebius carefully distinguished between creation and mediate creation. And Warfield found in this distinction the key to understanding important differences among views simplistically lumped together as theistic evolution. He applied Wolebius's conceptual scheme in a prolonged editorial note in The Bible Student, a new magazine intended for a lay audience. His use of that venue suggests that Warfield was eager to reach not just pastors and theologians, but a religious public concerned to keep their faith in the scriptures. In not too many years, the Bible student would evolve into a pretty strident fundamentalist publication. But in 1901, it carried one of Warfield's most careful and significant writings on the evolution question. Some who called themselves theistic evolutionists were effectively deists, Warfield observed in this piece, picturing God as creating the original world stuff and its laws and then letting them carry out the work of producing the habitable earth and its panoply of life forms over eons of time. To rule out the interfering hand of God into the natural world was to contradict the Christian gospel of supernatural salvation. And by the way, Warfield's example here of this kind of theistic evolutionist and effective deist was Otto Pfleiderer. Other theistic evolutionists, however, spoke of evolution as an instance of mediate creation, such as Makash, the Duke of Argyle, and the Roman Catholic J.A. Zahm, whose book Evolution and Dogma, Warfield made his prime example. These mediate creation evolutionists rightly wanted to preserve God's prerogative to intrude supernatural power into natural history at such points as the creation of life and of consciousness, not to mention the biblical miracles, the miracle of spiritual rebirth. War, uh, Warfield fully sympathized here. But on reading Wolebius, he decided that it was a mistake to classify evolution as a kind of mediate creation. Here is his discussion, and pardon me if I do badly on the Latin. Creation, he, Wolebius, says, these are all Warfield's words now, is, uh, well, Warfield quoting Wolebius, is that act by which God, for the manifestation of the glory of his power, wisdom, and goodness, has produced the world and all that is in it. We relapse now into his Latin. Partim ex nihilo, partim ex materia naturaliter in habili. That is to say, in part out of nothing, and in part out of pre-existing material indeed, but material not itself capable of producing this effect. Again, now we'll leave his words again. To create is not only to make something out of nothing, but also ex materia in habili, supra naturae vires aliquid producere. To produce something out of this inept material, above what the powers intrinsic in it are capable of producing. End quote. Mediate creation was God's act of intruding supernatural power into the normal web of natural causes that God, by his providence, was continually upholding and governing. When Jesus made water into wine, that was a mediate creation. Throughout the event, the jars contained the liquid, but the liquid changed from water to wine in a way water itself is never capable of doing. The water was not the means of the miracle, but the object acted upon by miraculous power. It was there by God's providence and became wine, not by creation out of nothing, but by an act of mediate creation. Those three modes of the supernatural, providence, creation, and mediate creation, needed to be distinguished. Each was supernatural, providence indirectly, as God acted, acts, through created means operating according to their created natures. Creation ex nihilo, utterly directly, and mediate creation, directly but making use of something already created, changing it in a way of which it was not as created capable. Most miracles, 
on these definitions, were acts of immediate creation. And in the curbing of the supernatural in these days that Warfield was complaining about, it was of, in these days of curbing the supernatural, it was of paramount importance to preserve the supernaturalness of miracles and not to fancy, not to fancy it a small thing to recast them as mere providences. Especially in the salvation of the individual sinner, it was crucial to recognize our need of a supernatural regeneration rather than tell us to imitate Christ by natural human effort. Warfield would find this notion of immediate creation useful in many ways, including his argument for the role of humanity's common reason in apologetics, in contrast to the views of Abraham Kuyper. It informed his doctrine of the role of human effort in sanctification, as versus the perfectionism of the victorious life movement. It elaborated his long-standing doctrine of God's activity in the mysterious process of inspiration, producing an inerrant Bible through the agency of imperfect human authors with the intrusion of supernatural power from above. When Warfield turned to consider John Calvin's doctrine of creation in 1915, he found that the great reformer made a point of reserving creation ex nihilo for the original world stuff and the souls of humankind. All else, Genesis treated as forming, gradual modeling into form, to use Warfield's interpolation, forming rather than creating as such. In answer to the scoffer's charge that an omnipotent God should not have needed to take six days to make the world, Calvin called his readers' minds, in Warfield's words, to dwell on the condescension of God in distributing his work into six days rather than a flash, so that our finite intelligence might not be overwhelmed with its contemplation and on the goodness of God in thus leading our thoughts to the consideration of the rest of the seventh day. And above all, on the paternal care of God in so ordering the work of bringing the world into being as to, pre as to prepare it for man before he introduced him into it. Unquote. Thus Calvin taught, again Warfield's words, that God perfected the world by process, progressus, and then he cites the Institutes 1.14.2. Not for his own sake, but for ours. God brought the world into being by process for our sake. Because our Heavenly Father wanted us to be able to contemplate his goodness in creation, he protracted the process so that our minds could perceive his sequence of loving acts in preparing our home. Calvin was not interested in the details of how God created the world, except as to encourage loving contemplation of those themes. Yet Warfield found in Calvin's exposition a surprising thing. In reserving the concept of creation proper for the original world stuff and human souls alone, Calvin taught, quote, Warfield here, the world as we now see it has been evoked by the progressive acts of God. And those progressive acts of God, Warfield then observes, Calvin does not refer to immediate creation as Willebius and other reformed divines did a few generations later. Calvin expressly refuses the idea of subsequent infusions of creative energy from outside God's providential activity. In creation week here we're talking about. In other words, the fashioning of the world and of life forms after the initial creation ex nihilo was entirely providential up until the creation of Adam's soul. And here Warfield makes his startling claim, and this is where Nolan Livingstone make their strong point. Warfield's words, it should scarcely be passed over without remark that Calvin's doctrine of creation is, if we have understood it aright, for all except the souls of men, an evolutionary one. The undigested mass, including the promise and potency of all that was yet to be, was called into being by the simple fiat of God. But all that has come into being since, except the souls of men alone, has arisen as a modification of this original world stuff by means of the interaction of its intrinsic forces. To him, prima causa omnium, 
And that not merely in the sense that all things ultimately in the world's stuff owe their existence to God, but in the sense that all the modifications of the world's stuff have taken place under the directly upholding and governing hand of God and find their account ultimately in his will. But they find their account proximately in second causes. And this is not only evolutionism, but pure evolutionism. Unquote. What the scientists called evolution, often imagining that evolution somehow took the place of God's activity, Warfield called providence. And not the providence of the deist who thought of natural law as providence's only mode. With Calvin, Warfield held a very high doctrine of providence as the constant forthputting of divine power in upholding the creatures in all their created powers. It is a mistake to cite this exposition of Calvin as proof that Warfield was placing the imprimatur of Calvin on the scientific theory of biological or cosmological evolution. But he was indeed finding theological precedent for a Christian and a Calvinist to allow evolution up to, but not including, the human soul. But more needs to be said. Warfield's exposition of Calvin on the lower creation, the world and its life forms, occupied about nine pages of that article on Calvin's doctrine of the creation. Warfield spent three times that space, 27 pages, expounding Calvin's doctrine of the angels and the use God made of angels as second causes in forming things as they now are. After all, what would the evolution of the world and, and life in just six days look like? Calvin doesn't believe in an old earth. He's picturing six days. What would the evolution of the world and life in just six days look like? Not the immensely protracted, gradual, and this-worldly natural process envisioned by the scientists. Warfield was an old earther, but Calvin was not. And so Calvin's doctrine of creation, providential in its mode, envisioned a very different kind of providence than what we would expect, an angelic one. Quoting Warfield, God executes his works of providence through the intermediation of second causes, for this is the very definition of providence. But among these second causes, there are always personal as well as impersonal agencies. And Calvin conceives that all the works of God's providence are wrought through the intermediation of angels. Suddenly this looks very different. Not that Warfield himself credits angels with causing or guiding evolution, but this aspect of the article, utterly passed over by commentators on Warfield's view of evolution, makes it clear that in expounding Calvin, Warfield was not recommending what we normally consider an evolutionary view of Earth history. He takes pains to emphasize, quote, the vividness of Calvin's sense of the spiritual environment in which our life is cast. And here another long Warfield quote. We see here that he conceived the universe as in all its operations moving on under the guiding hand of these superhuman intelligences. This is as much to say that there was no dualism in Calvin's conception of the universe. He did not set the spiritual and physical worlds or the earthly and supramundane worlds over against one another as separate and unrelated entities. He conceived them as all working together in one unitary system acting and interacting on one another. And he accustomed himself to perceive beneath the events of human history, whether corporate or individual, and beneath the very operations of physical nature, not merely the hand of God upholding and governing, but the activities of those hands of God who hearken to his voice and fulfill his word, and whom he not only charges with the care of his little ones and the direction of the movements of the peoples, but makes even winds and a flaming fire." Unquote. In providence, God thus universally operates through the instrumentality of subordinate intelligences, Warfield says of Calvin. God could have acted immediately, but he chose to operate through the angels in order quote, to give us not only his protection, but the sense of his protection. Dealing with us as we are, not as we ought to be, he is willing to appeal to our imagination and to comfort us in our feeling of danger or despair by enabling us to apprehend in our own way the presence of his grace. He promises not only that he will care for us, but that he sends, and now quoting Calvin, innumerable escorts, <laughs> 
to whom he has given charge to secure our safety. God wants us to contemplate the host of angelic intermediaries whom he sends not only occasionally but constantly so that the very world we inhabit was and is framed and formed by these guardians of our souls doing God's bidding. In light of this striking re-enchantment of the universe, Warfield hardly appears as the rationalist that he is sometimes accused of being. If he is endorsing here Calvin's providentialism as evolutionism, he is also endorsing a vivified spiritual universe of providential evolution by angelic beings. No wonder his later reviews of books on the evolution question display an annoyance at the anti-supernaturalistic bias of scientists who have no viable theory of the origin of the fittest, yet insist that such origin must avoid the supernatural. It is there that Fred Zaspel finds much supporting evidence for his contention that the progress of Warfield's thought was away from, not toward, support for evolution. But Warfield never repudiated the doctrine of evolution. He never endorsed it outright either. He allowed it. And in my opinion, Warfield expected it to be proven eventually, for he saw signs everywhere that God's standard operating procedure was gradual and progressive. This may be seen in the work of colleagues he brought to join him at Princeton Seminary. Gerhardus Voss, Princeton's first professor of biblical theology, taught a strikingly developmental view of the history of revelation in scripture. In his inaugural address, Voss declared, God has not communicated to us the knowledge of the truth as it appears in the calm light of eternity to his own timeless vision. The self-revelation of God is a work covering ages. The truth comes in the form of growing truth, not truth at rest. The task of biblical theology, Voss said, is the exhibition of the organic process of supernatural revelation in its historic continuity and multiformity. Voss employed an analogy of growth from seed to full flower, very much in keeping with the growth analogy used in non-Darwinian evolutionisms, in which every stage is perfect, though completion comes only at the end. This was the only way, Voss said, to reconcile the two great facts of scripture, divine perfection and historical process. Warfield himself employed this analogy of organic growth to the progress of theology. Theology was, in Warfield's words, an organic growth, the ripened fruit of the ages. The Westminster Confession, the latest of the classic Protestant doctrinal statements, far from suffering from its distance in time from the original impulse of the Reformation, represented for Warfield the ripest fruit of reformed creed making. And that was a plus, that was a recommendation. And perhaps the best example of Warfield's pervasive developmentalism is found in his response to the, per the perfectionism of let go and let God movements in his day. And I am near the end with this final quote. Men are unable to understand why time should be consumed in divine works. Why should the almighty maker of the heaven and earth take millions of years to create the world? Why should he bring the human race into being by a method which leaves it ever incomplete? Above all, in his recreation of a lost race, why should he proceed by process? Men are unwilling that either the world or they themselves should be saved by God's secular methods. I love that line. They demand immediate, tangible results. They ask, where is the promise of his coming? They ask to be themselves made glorified saints in the twinkling of an eye. God's ways are not their ways. And it is a great trial to them that God will not walk in their ways. They love the storm and the earthquake and the fire. They cannot see the divine in a sound of gentle stillness. And they adjust themselves with difficulty to the lengthening perspective of God's gracious working. They look every day for the cataclysm in which alone they can recognize God's salvation. In nature and in grace, God proceeds by process. Warfield was careful to guard the supernaturalism so crucial to a Christian view of the world and so crucial to the gospel of Christ that offered spiritual rebirth, a new creation. But the nature of supernatural agencies was somewhat scrutable. And theologians, could, theologians past could help us understand God's secular methods as something far more spiritual 
than theistic evolutionists typically teach. Thank you. All right, we do have time for some questions. Um, so again, we have microphones that are circulating. If you just raise a hand, um, we can, I'll call on you and we'll uh, get a microphone to you as we can. Austin Freeman. And Thank if you, you Dr. Get in the, sorry, if you want to get in the queue, go ahead and keep your hand up and I'll um, recognize you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with Warfield's theory on evolution, although I am now. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about his method of dealing with other objections to evolution, such as um, animal death, um, wastefulness, th things like that, which yeah. would have ha occurred prior to the fall. So where does his doctrine of the fall and sin come into his picture of things? Warfield does not have a problem with animal death and suffering before the fall. Um, let's see how far I get in this. Uh, James Moore, in his book, The Post-Darwinian Controversies, makes the observation that it seems that the more classic a Calvinist a thinker was, the easier a time he had with evolution. And uh, that may have to do with kind of a tough-minded view of the world, not expecting everything to be sweetness and light. Um, animal death to Warfield doesn't possess moral or spiritual significance. And um, he, he actually doesn't spend a lot of time dealing with that issue, frankly. Uh, we have a gentleman here in the blue jacket, blue blazer. Uh, Thomas Middlebrook. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, you were aware if Mr. Warfield used uh, the Genesis uh, quote, let us make man in our image as part of his scriptural support for um, the immediate creation of using angels. Because, uh, I mean, yes. besides a, a generic use of angels yeah. as yeah. media uh, forces, was that a specific one that he appealed to, or did he have others Warfield that he liked to in his to? own writings about himself, you know, from his own point of view about the evolution question, doesn't talk about angels. But expounding Calvin, he does. So a question then remains, is Warfield endorsing this view or not? I mean, it's rather interesting that it doesn't show up otherwise, right? But uh, this article, Calvin's Doctrine of the Creation, is the one most cited by the people who want to use Warfield as a theistic evolutionist because, as David Livingstone will say, obviously Warfield loved Calvin, and uh, in finding Calvin to be a pure evolutionist, Warfield is trying to find support for his own view. That's the claim, right? I'm not at all convinced that Warfield is, uh, that I am, in fact, quite, con I am convinced that it is wrong to say that Warfield affirmed evolutionism as proven as, and as, you know, the way God fashioned the world. Um, so the, the problem here is that Warfield is acting here very much as a historical theologian, I suppose, and he's, he's simply trying to say what Calvin says, and he offers no comment otherwise. But then again, why put this forward if he didn't have, you know. So I think that Warfield finds this very intriguing to think about angels as the agency there. Uh, but you raise an issue that I guess I'd like to, to mention. Um, when you read Peter Ents on Biologos, or you read uh, Noel and Livingstone on Warfield as the inerrantist, as evolutionist, uh, they like to point especially to the doctrine of concursus. And I, um, left that out of this paper because I'm still trying to figure it out now, having only very recently run across this bit about the angels and so forth, okay? Uh, Warfield's successor in the chair of systematic theology was Charles Hodge's grandson, Caspar Wister Hodge, Jr., who came alongside Warfield in 1906 to be his assistant in theology, and he starts teaching the... Um, the theology sequence required of the seminarians. Uh, and so he takes over Warfield's, oh, he has to write his own, uh, lectures on the doctrine of man. And there, uh, we, we find Casper uh, Wister Hodge Jr. saying that 
Well, defining concursus in a way that I'm not sure is correct, <laughs> and uh, uh, placing concursus entirely within the doctrine of providence, rather than concursus allowing any, you know, this is God, God's concursive activity, uh, activity alongside of human activity, right? Or in this case, alongside of natural law. Um, and he seems to set concursus apart from the doctrine of immediate creation. But in other places, I'm finding Warfield talking about concursus as involving, as being more like immediate creation. So I actually invite any input from anybody who knows more about this. I'm, this is something I'm starting to look into right now. Uh, so, so, yeah. There was another question somewhere? Yeah. What role is that gentleman here in the blue shirt? Sorry, Nathan Scott. Uh, I was wondering about, again, the issue of the angels, but as you yeah. said, it's not as strong a thing. But yeah. uh, this notion of God using creation or uh, created beings in the work of creation and process. Yes. Where does the line draw as we work into God's recreation work in the atonement and things like that? And especially even, is it limited to divine beings, like celestial beings, and how does that work into humanity's involvement and things like that? Are you asking whether celestial beings will be redeemed? No, I mean the, the work of celestial beings being involved in creation work. And what about redemption with, work. And then what about, how does that play out in redemption work? And then how do we draw the line between angelic created beings versus human created beings? Yeah. Well, it's very hard to find Warfield talking a lot about angels. Okay, he does have, a, he does have an article on um, the angels of these little ones or something like that, he, about, about guardian angels. He actually looks into that some. But Warfield seems to have been very cherry about um, talking about supernatural beings very much. In fact, in, um, in uh, the 1880s, a man named John Livingston Nevius, who had been a uh, missionary to China, and his missionary method is very important in the evangelization of Korea. Um, Nevius uh, posthumously uh, published a book called Demon Possession and Allied Themes, uh, which uh, claimed that uh, he, he claimed that uh, the Chinese uh, Christians' testimony to demonic activity among them uh, suggested that uh, these supernatural kind of things that we see described in the New Testament are still happening today. And so this book was recommended as kind of an apologetic for the, uh, the, the miraculous worldview of New Testament times. Warfield did an unprecedented thing in his um, uh, Presbyterian and Reformed Review. He never had books re-reviewed. But when a second edition of this came out, the, the favorable review that had been made by a friend of his, Samuel Lowry, Warfield then replaced, or I should say, you know, countered, with a review of his own, where he, he was not willing to say that such demonic activity was happening in, um, in China or anywhere else these days. And I think it's because Warfield didn't want to tie the question of the miraculous in New Testament times to to something that could be disproven in modern times because you could actually go and try to scrutinize these things and find some natural reason for them or something. So you might wonder what this has to do with your question, right? Angelic beings, well, de demons are angelic beings gone bad. And Warfield seemed to want to kind of keep that back in the Bible and not too much today uh, when, at least speaking apologetically, I, I, so there's an interesting connection to his very famous cessationism, right? Warfield wrote Counterfeit Miracles. He's probably the most famous evangelical cessationist lately. Um, but uh, Warfield and the Angels, uh, on the one, he'll, he'll, he'll put it in the mouth of Calvin, but he's not talking too much about it himself. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, join me here. We start again at 11. Let's try it again. Try to do a little better than we did this last time and get it here on time. Uh, we'll, we'll start again right 11 for Fred Sanders' paper on William Burton Pope on the Doctrine of Creation. Let's join, uh, join me in thanking Brad. Thank you. Thank you.